Uh, Dr. Bowditch received her doctorate in art history from the University of Chicago in 1994 and has been teaching full-time at the College of St. Rose in Albany, New York since 95. She regularly teaches modern art, contemporary art, and history of photography. Lucy Bowditch's signature course is called Art Now, where she takes students to see 70 New York City exhibitions during the spring semester. Wow. Her work is found in numerous publications, including After Image, the Journal of Media Arts and Cultural Criticism, History of Photography, The Photo Review, The New England Quarterly, A Historical Review of New England Life, and Letters, Art Criticism, and Source, Notes in the Histories of Art. She has contributed chapters to several books, which are Ecologies of Seeing, Art in Time, uh, Art in Place, Site-Specific Art of the Americas, Currently, she's working on Gustave Courbet's paintings from the 1850s. The working title of this project is Courbet's Lingerie. Lucy, take it away. Oh, Malvika, thank you for those kind words. I, I appreciate it. And I just want to say to the whole team at Brooklyn Rail, thank you so much for this amazing opportunity to introduce uh, the phenomenal uh, artist, photographer, Anne Lay. Um, I'm going to start with her moment in the United States and then circle back to Vietnam. And our first, the first photograph we will look at will be from uh, some of her early work there. But um, she was born in Vietnam and as the North was invading, got out of Vietnam and uh, landed in eventually in Huntington Beach, California, where a, an amazing trajectory ensued. She uh, survived and excelled in high school, went on to Stanford University to get a BA and an MA in biology, and on a lark, took a photography course with Laura Volkerding, who, by the way, on me, I met. I met her in Chicago in 1979. Yes, oh, that's a just amazing thing. And everything got a little strange after that. Uh, on me was set for medical school, yeah, but she became very curious in phot about photography. She took on a project where she was uh, working on an encyclopedia having to do with craftsmen and artisans of a guild that was founded in the Middle Ages. Um, and she, during that time in France, went to Montpellier, explored the archives of, of photographs from the French colonial period, um, including images of Vietnam, and she was in it. Uh, she then came back to the States and uh, uh, pursued a degree, an MFA, at Yale in photography, where she studied with Todd, Bob, Todd Papa George, uh, Lois Connor, uh, Richard Benson, and her career has just uh, continued. Um, the recent wonderful catalog published by the Carnegie Museum of Art um, has divided much of her work into five discrete bodies, Vietnam, where she returns, Small Wars, which involves photographing Americans reenacting the Vietnam War, um, 29 Palms, where she photographs real soldiers training in San Bernardino Valley, Events Ashore, which is a project that dovetails with 29 Palms, um, and she works, among other things, on the uh, USS Peleliu, have I, am I pronouncing that? Yes. Peleliu. Um, and then her ongoing and current project, Silent General, an, uh, an homage to Walt Whitman's specimen days, uh, an autobiographical account of his working with soldiers from the North and the South uh, during the Civil War. Um, she has been a 2012 MacArthur fellow recipient. She also received the Tim Tiffany Comfort Foundation Fellowship, uh, a Guggenheim, the National Science Foundation, Antarctic Artists and Writers Program Award. Uh, 
the only thing missing, I'm sorry, from this list is the Nobel Prize. And I think that that could be in order because she really is an, a trained scientist, an amazing artist, and in her full body of work, a peacemaker of her own, uh, of a unique nature. And I'd like to circle back to the, the ellipses at the beginning. Um, An Millet was born in Vietnam. Her mother was from the north. Her father was from the south. And, the excuse me? The center of Vietnam. The center. And when she was eight, her mother went to the Sorbonne to pursue a PhD. And then when you were about 13, is this right? 12, 13? She, everybody else is getting out of Vietnam. The North has yeah. taken Saigon and she and her mother are returning because her father is still there as a guarantee that they would return to Vietnam. She gets, she experiences this war condition, the invasion of the North. She and her father get out with her brothers and her mother is one of the very last people to escape. She's airlifted off the roof of the American embassy. I mean, it just, it makes me feel so strange even describing this. So my question, and this is my only Terry Gross question, how did that feel? And how do you think it impacted your work? Um, well, well, before we answer that question and get on, I just wanted to say that Lucy probably meant the Nobel Prize, N-O-B-L-E. Uh, we were never talking about anything else. Uh, <laughs> but um, I, I, I think that uh, as a 13-year-old, uh, being airlifted and living under war conditions, um, I, don't think, I don't think that you one understands the, the, the implication and one understands one uh, feel any fears um, because you are in the middle of it and it's all about uh, uh, solving the problem and going through life and doing what you need to do. And I still remember being much more fearful of the war the few years we lived in France looking at the news than actually being there. Um, but uh, um, more recently, uh, my husband and I watched um, that documentary called uh, The Fall of Saigon by Rory Kennedy, which, which is extraordinary. And I think that that's when I understood how uh, terrifying and how uh, devastating the, the whole event was and how, uh, like John said, uh, we could have been um, not airlifted. And, and it was just by the threat of a, um, I don't know what the expression is, that we, we, were, we were saved. So, um, but, but I think that documentary really captured uh, the entire event and its chaos and, and its devastation. So um, the, the effect of it is, is that um, I think like a lot of uh, children who have lived through, and again, you know, my experience is, is, is very tame compared to other experience that many Vietnamese refugees have had. Uh, really, really tame in comparison. But I think that uh, children who have um, survived war um, have experienced some kind of PTSD where they, they uh, try to bury the, the, the past or they think it was not a big deal and they just want to move forward because it's just too painful to go back and think. And, and, and I think that the first time I was in an aircraft carrier, I realized that Maybe, you know, my working so hard to have access on an aircraft carrier had something to do with my mother being um, airlifted and dropped on an aircraft carrier um, at the end of the war. Um, and so there are echoes of, of um, uh, what I experienced throughout my work. And, and I think it's, it's about uh, gaining clarity, it's about uh, perhaps trying to have more control over um, a childhood where I had no control, where everything was uh, decided by American foreign policy. Um, and, and so it's a way to kind of uh, um, reclaim something and, and not necessarily have closure, but, but, but I think the, the, one of the main reasons I became a photographer was that it, it was a way it gave me license, or having a camera gave me license to um, 
go out and explore um, a world or explore um, a community that I was curious about. Uh, it gave me license to ask questions. You know, I think it's always easier to ask someone something when you have a camera. It seems like you have a reason. And, and I love the camera for that. And so uh, being witness, uh, being out there and trying to understand the glimpses of uh, as a child was very important to me. Yeah, I just parenthetically wanted to note that that rupture that was a result of the war coincides with adolescence, which is another rupture. So often when people go from one country to another, even if there's not a war, it creates a, 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 dram a dramatic physical marking of a, of a change that's going to be in, inevitable. Um, but maybe we could go to the first yes. uh, photograph. Ah, oh, there we go. So this is untitled Mekon Delta, 1994. It's a relatively early work. Um, it is in black and white, as opposed to a lot, a lot of the recent work is in color. It is very uh, poetic. Um, it almost reminds me of Paul Caponegro. Did we have that comparison in there, Louis? And now we can go back to the um, Mekon. So it has, it has this musical, poetic feeling, uh, the, the, the waving, blurry bamboo in the foreground, the very tightly framed uh, family in this circle that's made by the fence around the, are those uh, geese? Um, uh, they're ducks, I think. Ducks, around the ducks. Um, can you... Can you speak to that sort of poetic sensibility, almost um, uh, you know, very reminiscent in this in this photograph? But these early photographs, this was from the first trip back to Vietnam in the mid nineteen nineties when Clinton renewed relations, and and all of us uh, Vietnamese Americans living here, we never thought we could return home. So this was. Uh, a, a momentous event and, and it was uh, very emotional and, and a revelation for me to be able to be on Vietnamese soil again. Um, I was never a landscape photographer, uh, not for lack of trying, um, and, and somehow suddenly I became a landscape photographer and, and, and it was a very intuitive process. Um, I think that this picture was about me seeing the landscape of the Mekong Delta for the first time and being able to explore it. Um, it was a safe travel there, you know, Mekong's very close to Saigon, but it was dangerous. And so we may drive through very quickly, but we never stopped. And I knew the Mekong mostly from news photographs of um, GIs being airlifted and uh, swirling rice fields and, and, and that sort of, you know, blurry, um, flying uh, pieces of grass everywhere, that, that sort of feeling. And, and um, I can't say that I saw that in this picture. This picture was actually a technical mistake. Uh, I did not have a light meter, and, I, and this was uh, at the dusk, and I kind of guessed the exposure time, and I think I was so afraid of underexposing the film that I made a, a, a five-second exposure uh, and ask the people to hold still, and that explains all the blurry uh, weaving of the bamboos and the ducks and everything, and it created this world. And, and I have to say that when I saw the contact sheet for the first time, um, I, I didn't really see it as something uh, um, that would work. Uh, it took me a while to recognize it. Um, but it, 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 this picture encapsulates uh, so much for me. Um, this idea of the family unit safe in this harbor, even though it's completely created, they're not even together. I think the husband, the, the man and the woman are related, but uh, it, it's not really a family. So um, it, it, it's a learning experience. This picture was a, um, a, a kind of marker for me. Um, I, I think it's quite beautiful. Um, and that very happy blur that's a result of the long exposure works so 
so well. But things really change in your work. Can we go to the next image? So this is much later, 2007, uh, Navy uh, watchstander, uh, and we're looking at a color work. Uh, it's very sharp. Um, and this is where I have my graduate student question. So we all read Roland Barth, and we read the photographic message and that most irritating part where he writes that the photograph is a is a, a message without a code or an image without a, a message without a code. And I, as a, a person thinking about photography, I would get so upset by that. I understand what he meant, but when we make photographs, we use a certain format camera, we choose color or black and white, we think about the frame, uh, we think about the depth and in this picture on Mila, I was wondering if you could speak to the question of format, your choice to go to color, um, and the very uh, particular framing. Everything is so uh, everything is so considered. What happens at the lower right hand corner, the teeny little orange in that that mechanical device on the left hand side, the orange cord uh, coming down. Um, that arc of yellow, it's, it's just so large format-ish. Yes. Uh, it's so great that you mentioned Bart because I never quote him to my students. And uh, um, I actually, because we spoke yesterday, I actually went back and, and, and reread um, and also consulted with my dear friend, Gilles Perez, who, who knows uh, Bart and everything else uh, at the tip of his fingers and we had a long discussion and so yes it's about a message without a code and this kind of translation of reality three dimension to two dimension and this kind of collapsing but it happens within a, a, a kind of a, a cultural context and a particular time and space so there's a notion of connotation and so i think it's within that procedure of connotation where um, the author is able to inject um, what you talk about in terms of codes. And, and so um, as a photograph not being objective. And so within that connotation, um, I decided to um, uh, use a large format camera um, because I'm interested in, in a particular description. And again, that idea of you know, the image and how it goes about uh, this has been and the medium, uh, I, I wanted to step away as much as possible from the idea of a photograph. So how do you give someone an experiential physical experience by having a, a large enough print with details with a kind of physicality and a large format negative, especially five, seven, and definitely eight by 10, describes things um, allows for air to, to for you to feel that air flows between things uh, when you look at a print and so for example um, you won't feel that the girl is standing on top of the next barrier there's actually air in between her and um, that sort of uh, 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 net that you see before you get to the horizon and so I was interested in all of that um, but of course, using a large format camera creates other problems, um, which I, I think that ultimately I decided that I wanted to uh, take on and, and, you know, it's all a matter of balance. What do you choose and what problems do you deal with? And so a large format camera means that there's less flexibility, you can't catch things uh, uh, surreptitiously, you can't be spontaneous, um, you know, uh, you, you often describe things in a way where everything is more leveled and, and, but I wanted to embrace that. And so it also meant asking people to pose because the exposure time is a little longer. Uh, so I think it forces you, even though you lose um, 
uh, that sort of uh, uh, spontaneity, it forces you to look for things that are on the edge of things. You know, photography often propels you to photograph the extraordinary, the momentous, or that punctum. And with a view camera, you, you're not allowed to do it. So what else is there? And that is always the question. Um, so I'm interested in describing. Uh, I'm interested in um, the uniform and, and the, the pleats and the the details on the deck of this uh, oil platform, um, all of that matters um, because I think it's about uh, um, being there and, and translating or providing that experience. Um, I switched to color because uh, it was mostly a technical reason. Um, often at sea, everything is so um, gray and murky and I felt that uh, the black and white film would not be able to describe the changes in something that's a colder gray versus a warmer gray. And so I switched to color. Um, but I have to say that for the longest time, I was a color photographer. No, I was a black and white photographer with color film in my camera. It, it, it took me uh, quite a while to understand uh, how color works, even though, you know, I, I, I give, I, I assigned a John Tchaikovsky's um, little introduction or humongous introduction to um, Eggleston's guide, um, his essay about color, I, I always assign it to my students. Um, um, is, that was a long explanation. Um, Wonderful. No, I, I really love the part where you said, I'm photographing something along the lines, I'm photographing at sea and all, there are all these subtle grays and light blues and they weren't going to quite work in black and white. Um, so that, that's extremely informative. Um, can we go to the next image? So high school students, 4th of July celebration, New Orleans, 2017. Um, there are a couple of concerns or questions I have regarding this photograph. First, I wanted to quickly take a look at a well-known other photograph of the 4th of July, just for a nanosecond, the Robert Frank 4th of July, J. New York from 1956, where we see that real underbelly beat generation sensibility that questions uh, the American sense of post-World War II security. And can we go back to, um, on these photograph. So here, you do not have that kind of negativity, that kind of criticism, uh, but everything is in the balance, right? You, you, there's a sense of possibility, there's a sense of optimism. Um, the, it's true that the two, uh, Caucasian girls are looking at each other and the African-American woman is looking out toward, out into space beyond the picture plane. So she's not visually part of their loop, yes, but she's, she's a little disconnected. She's quite disconnected, but she's beautifully posed within the composition, you know, making one think of Manet's Déjeuner sur l'Ebre for a second. Um, but it, but she's there, and it's her very presence in this context that is uh, so uh, interesting. That you suspend us between inside and outside, which brings me to the question of the composition. To what degree were these three girls, uh, three young women, posed? Well. Um... They were together um, and, and they were on this uh, blanket. And I first saw the um, young woman with the red hair and, and, and thought she was extraordinary. And of course, you know, to, to photograph, um, I, I see that Tina Barney's here. <laughs> I'm sure what I'm saying would resonate with her um, and my camera's a lot smaller. Um, you know, with, with a large format camera, you, you, you have to ask permission, you know? I mean, if you're further away on the bridge, I could have 
photograph them, but I had to ask for permission. Of course, people move when you start talking to them. And so I had to somehow describe to the young woman with the red hair how I saw her and if she could do that again. And I think the, the rest just kind of fell into place. And, and I did take six pictures, seven pictures, and I, I tried different combinations. I tried two, three. Um, um, but, but I think that this picture for me is, is a kind of response to, um, and I'm, I'm glad that you, you saw the subtleties in their relationships. And it's, it's a response to, I think, the way, um, and, and it was leading up to the presidential election, this, this um, way of um, uh, 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 reducing and simplifying, you know, issues that are so complex and so important and also volatile uh, um, and still are. Uh, whether it's immigration, uh, um, um, the controversy, you know, uh, um, Charlottesville, um, race, uh, everything that was so explosive and it, it was so reduced into the slogans and these uh, um, campaign um, uh, slogans that, that, that were screamed. And uh, I don't have an answer to any of those problems but I, I saw this and 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 for me like you said it it, it has a ray of hope uh, but it also does not shy away from the fact that it is very complicated um i mean the girls are from the same uh, uh i think uh economical uh the same slice of, of life so it's not like the, the differences are that great um but uh um but they are different yes Right. I mean, right. They're, they're from apparently the same social milieu. Yeah. Um, but they, what... They're in high school, but they are, you know, they're... Different. Right. Um, but I, I just want to underline what you just mentioned, which is that, you know, compared to Frank, you have maintained this, this optimism, this sense... That it's almost a dare I say, a moral position you take in terms of suspending uh, situations that are rife with, with amazing uh, con potential conflict. Um, and that ability, especially in our current moment, is, is so uh, charged, so significant. I, I just don't have enough, I don't have the words to indicate how important it feels right now to be able to do that. Um, so could we go to the next photograph, please? Um, so this is a, another photograph that just seems so perfect in many ways. Um, those boxes, those containers seem to glow a little bit. And um, can I just see the comparisons for a moment um, in terms of staging you you don't seem to have totally banished the optical unconscious as jeff wall does um but the 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 figures in the foreground uh seem to be very considered and could i have the next comparison lewis I think Lewis is just, there we go. So of course, Mie, the gleaners comes to mind. And could we now go back to the uh, Anmi's photograph? I'm sorry, I think you were frozen for a second. Okay, there we go. Um, so uh, it looks, even though I, I know that you're not in the program with Jeff Wall and Gregory Crutzen in terms of banishing Walter Benjamin's optical unconscious. There is this very contained quality with the figures in the foreground. Um, and of course, I can't look at it without thinking of Mie's The Gleaners. Um, but there is something else here too, uh, which is this notion of focus and the inevitable sense of politics where we're looking at migrant workers and labor, the idea of work itself. Um, and I was wondering if you could speak to this notion of 
labor as, as evidenced in this almost magical photograph with those uh, satchels? Well, I decided to go to the Central Valley um, as a response to, uh, I think, the, the controversy with the wall. Um, it, it was driving me crazy uh, that we were so focused on the wall, on the construction of the wall, and on, on producing or even eliminating immigration. And for me, the, uh, the ground zero to this problem is, is that uh, the use of uh, migrant workers. Uh, um, one of the ground zeros uh, in the Central Valley uh, providing all of the and some of our, our students. Um, so it, it seemed to me that the, of course, we all know that the, the idea of the wall is just so incongruous and so uh, antithetical to, to any, everything we believe in. So it, it, it was probably interesting, it would be interesting to go to the Central Valley and see what happens there. Um, I, I had no idea what I would find, uh, um, but um, I knew that uh, uh, labor was also important to, for me and that I should focus on, on that work and, and, and it, I equate labor with sacrifice. And um, I, I think growing up, you know, um, and because of the war, um, it was always kind of pounded to me that um, uh, you could lose your uh, uh, college degree, your, the paperwork, but if you, kept all your skills and your labor, you, you would always survive if you knew how to build something, if you knew how to make something. And, and so the idea of labor um, is uh, important to me. And, and, and labor is also a one-to-one -one equation. It seems like, at least on the first round, you can't really um, um, uh, speculate on labor. And uh, I like that idea that it's honest. There's something so honest and authentic about uh, making things and working. Uh, anyway, um, I, I think what, what's um, so exciting for me with photography is to be there and, and not just learning something I didn't know, but, but seeing something that is so surprising that I could never even imagine. Um, and, and that's what this picture represents for me. I mean, this idea of these boxes glowing, uh, I had no idea how asparagus were harvested. Uh, I always imagined them growing in this huge plant and you'd be standing at waist level and, and cutting them like this. But, but uh, seeing them bending and seeing the curve of their backs just was heartbreaking for me. And, and so I knew that I, that's what I had to show. Uh, and so the, the magic of the boxes and the, the bending of the backs was what I wanted to try to describe. Um, and, and of course you have this rectangle, you can't move it. Uh, so I, I basically had to define the area where this would take place and, and, and ask the workers to kind of do their work within uh, that imagined frame. Um, and so it's partly directed and it's partly about uh, um, um, accepting the gift that was given uh, uh, to me that day. Right, which, which uh, brings up a question that I didn't write down but it needs to be integrated somewhere about the the documentary the weirdness of the documentary that could be asked about any number of your photographs that uh the the, the documentary's relationship to a, spe a specific factual moment that things are often um uh tweaked a little bit um but could we go to the next the next photograph please So citrus tree, Fowler, California, um, I looked at this tree and I thought, okay, a concentric composition, the tree's right in the middle. Uh, that's not a new thing. Uh, could I have the next slide, Louis, for a moment, the tenar? So there's a long history for this and tenar is a photographer with whom you became familiar early on. If we could go back to the citrus tree. So here's this tree and it is in the middle of the composition, yet not really symmetric. It has that strange cutout on the right hand side, yet there's a part of another tree on the left hand side. It is 
abundant, it's, it's heavy with fruit, yet burdened uh, in some way. Could you comment on making this photograph and why you chose this tree? Well, uh, we were driving um, that day. This is still in the Central Valley. And I was so struck by how um, laden with fruits um, this tree was. Um, and it was smaller than most of the other trees. I think you can get a sense that there's a taller tree next to it. Um, it's, it's also scraggly, but then abundant. And, and somehow for me, it was so symbolic of this idea that um, we're not going to go hungry. There are all these fruits that are abandoned on this on this tree that are not being picked. Um, I mean, I, I sort of see this as a kind of portrait, um, and and in a portrait you always look for something that is more complicated. You know, uh, um, I think if we talk about Sander, we talk about the way people project themselves and being able to see the fault line. Uh, between that projection and what you think they may actually be, um, and 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 perhaps you know um, this represented an opportunity in that sense. But you know, I I, I love seeing the ten R pictures that you um, showed. Um, but of course, I thought of Ajay's um, pictures of the apple trees um, or Freelander's apple trees. Um, yeah, it, it it was kind of. Uh, somewhat stupid to just plop it in the middle. Um, <laughs> but, uh, uh, sometimes you just have to do it. Um, and, and I think it would have been too mannered to try to find a different composition for it. So I just plopped it in the middle. And, and well, I think it's amazing. To, yeah, and not try to isolate it too much uh, from, from everything else. Um, but I, I actually found out that the tree is diseased. Um, and uh, that's why it had been abandoned. But again, it's it's that uh, an overarching theme of bringing together these irreconcilable opposites. So the abundant tree that is abandoned, right? That again, two two sides. Um, could we go to the next photograph, please? So uh, this photograph of a family under the Presidio Ojinaga International Bridge, Rio Grande, Texas, Mexico border is relatively recent, 2019. Uh, again, there's this photographing from afar. Um, and for a, a moment, the picture brought to mind, could we have the comparison, Louis, just here, brought to mind some of the lantern slides I'm aware of by William Henry Jackson. This was when he was hired by the Mexican Railroad to photograph. And he, uh, it appears that he's looking out of a train down into the landscape and the figures are quite anecdotal. Um, and this is, I'm showing you a glass lantern slide with a paper mount on it. Um, could we go back to uh, the family? And, and now here's, you still have that distant view and you're looking down, but it is so different in that the family seems so particular. Um, the the use of, of color is so perfect. That child in the middle that's a little orangey and that post on the bridge, right, have a they have a conversation going. Um, and the, the family is on this little oasis surrounded by uh, bits of the river. Um, can you comment on making this photograph and what you were thinking? Well, I, I went to the Texas and Mexico border again um, because of my interest in uh, the issue of the wall and immigration. Um, and I did not know much about um, life at the border, and, 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 but I had the sense that there was a, an organic flow of life across the border. Uh, you know, Texas was part of Mexico for so long, um, and I wanted to experience that. Um, so, um, the, 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 this is the Rio Grande. So, um, we are at the border, and um, um, 
I, I think, you know, I, I photograph a lot and I chose this picture because I think it's a perfect uh, um, response to uh, so many pictures we've seen of um, um, Salvadorans and other South Americans trying to cross uh, and swim across the, the Rio Grande, uh, perhaps drowning in, in, in the, the, that, the, those disastrous uh, uh, um, occurrences. And, and I chose this because um, the families together um, they were actually swimming and, and, and trying to get a respite from the, the sun. This is in the middle of August. Um, but they look shipwrecked, perhaps, uh, in the middle of this river. Um, I mean, you know that we are near the border from the tidal, under this bridge. And, and so you don't know on which, side, on which side they are, whether they're on the Mexican side or on the uh, American side. Um, and um, I, I think... It, I thought it would be an interesting way to talk about uh, the current issues. The, the um, suspension. But the scale is important. You know? I, I think, yeah, the suspension. Um, it, it was important to pull back, to, to show uh, their relationship uh, to the bridge, to the river. Um, I think that, you know, someone else could have just gotten closer and just talked about the family. But for me, it's always that relationship, the family within something larger and how far can you go back before you actually lose that sense of this family unit. Um, the gestures, you know, I made more than one and you had, I just had to choose the right version with the gestures that were the most expressive and the most interesting. You know, I wanted to show gestures that I felt I had not seen before. Um, right, right. Um, well, it's, it, it, it has such a particularity to it by comparison to the Jackson, where the Jackson invites me to ask questions about the politics of representation, whereas this takes me in a, in a completely different uh, direction because it, at some level it seems to acknowledge specificity. Um, could, could we go to the next photograph, please? So this is part of an ongoing series um, that uh, generally titled S Silent General, and it's an homage to Walt Whitman's Specimen Days, which is an autobiographical account of his days tending to uh, soldiers of the Civil War, soldiers from both the North and the South. And in this uh, project and certainly in the two photographs that we're going to look at, um, there is again this particular relationship to very entrenched sides. Um, and I, I just wanted to read a, a sentence from a 2003 essay. Um, this would be David Levy Strauss, who wrote, um, the relationship between aesthetics and politics was a matter of great contention at the end of the 20th century, although too much of the discussion about it consisted of apodictic pronouncements and invective dismissals. It was good to have people arguing about it again. Um, and what is significant to me, or notable to me about this series is it, in a way, transcends argument. It, it, it manages to be in both places. Um, so here we look at the statue of Robert E. Lee um, through this chain link fence, through the trees, through the lamppost, um, through the scaffolding. And then if we could go to the next picture, please. Uh, we see the Robert E. Lee statue and the uh, Beauregard monument have been removed. They're now in storage. Um, yet in this place of storage, they once again uh, become uh, m monumental in a way. Um, so I see in this project, in looking at just these two photographs, again, this strange element of trying to take in the big picture, trying to um, embrace 
multiple ways of seeing the the situation. Um, can you speak a little bit to that series of uh, Silent General? Well, I think that Silent General, um, I could not have done this five years ago. Um, and I think that um, having complete, having returned home to Vietnam, having worked with the Vietnam reenactors, having traveled with the Navy, um, I, I, I feel that I understand uh, what being an American, what being an artist means, uh, what living in this country means. Um, I think I had always, you know, I, I, uh, I speak French, I, I feel very comfortable living in France, and for a while I thought France was my home, <laughs> but I was always looking for my home and until I realized that it is here and, and my identity is that of an artist, not necessarily Vietnamese or French or American. Uh, uh, so I think I feel very at home to tackle this, this project. And I've always admired and loved uh, Robert Frank's The Americans. I love Stephen Shore's work, um, Joel Sternfeld. But that idea of the American road trip of the American landscape never spoke to me. I just couldn't see myself in there. Um, it, it just didn't make sense until very recently. Um, so I feel completely implicated and 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 uh, I mean I, just like a lot of projects I don't think I started out with so much conviction um, uh, things always happen um, by chance um, but but that's that's how I feel at this point and and I see it as an American road trip I see it as a, an exploration of uh, where we are at this moment in this country um, and and it's very selfish because I think it gives me great um, uh, 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 it, it gives me hope and it gives me um, uh, something to look forward to uh, during this very difficult time. It's very, indeed, yeah. it's very strange time. And I think that is the, a, a hallmark, this notion of hope and, and optimism that is a strain through much of the work. Um, could we go to the next image, please? But I wanted to say also that yeah. the work is not prescriptive in the sense that I'm not trying to inject uh, sp specific ideas uh, 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 about how one should feel. And I, I don't have an answer for the immigration problem. And, and obviously I think it's, it's, so much of it is wrong. Um, and, 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 and it's bigger than me. And I think I would like it to remain something larger than myself. I think I'm just trying to lay out um, with images and simple titles, what the problem is, and, and to try to get us to think and to perhaps uh, approach thing from, uh, things from a, a different perspective. It, it, indeed, and, and so here is um, a photograph from a little earlier, 2010, and the Marine Corps Weapons Company Earthquake Relief uh, Haiti. And we spoke about this one earlier, and I thought you could come back to the, the conversation about the body language, the poses of the, of the various constituent, the various parties within the photograph. Yeah, with this picture, I've always loved this picture and I, I don't think it's anybody's favorite, um, but I, I have always been attached to it. And I think I finally understood uh, more recently that it, it has to do with, uh, so this this happened uh, right after the the devastating earthquake in Haiti in 2010, and this is one of the few times where I actually was in the front line where something momentous happened. Um, uh, and this is what I brought back. Uh, so so of course you know uh, there were pictures of of the Marines walking through uh, a, a church in Rumble uh, um, that was uh, uh, very impressive. Um, but I, ch I, I didn't choose any of those pictures because I'm very sensitive about this idea of uh, a, a disaster porn or w whatever it is. So this is what I came back with. And it's important to me because um, of the sense of the, the physicality and the suggestion of power uh, with this um, marine weapons company. And, and it brings me back to my childhood. And I think it's also replicated. Um, you can see it in different films and 
uh, in Iraq. And, um, but that idea of the, um, the tension between the people who live in a country and this arriving external force. So they're here to help. Um, they have all the gear, uh, the all, uh, incredible trucks. Um, but there's a fine line between helping and perhaps invading, um, uh, conquering. And, and I have to say, I've watched, um, uh, you know, other militaries. I mean, not too many, you know, the French I've watched, Japanese, definitely the Vietnamese military. None of them really have the kind of uh, 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 imposing physical physicality of these guys who just arrived. They've never been to Haiti before, but it's the way, I'm sorry, we don't have close-ups of normally I show close-ups in, uh, in my um, presentations. You know, the way they have their arms out and, um, uh, Lucy noticed one of the men who's standing in front of the Humvee and you see his back and his arms are just like that. And, and they're just waiting for the next thing that they have to do. So this is what they do in repose. And, and, right. and oh, that nice. alone. Thanks. Interesting. And then well, on the edge, you have the Haitians who, you know, with their, uh, you know, their arms, of course, they probably uh, have not had full meals in so long. And so they're very skinny um, and, and they, don't own this is their, their land and they don't own it but they're kind of on the periphery but they're also trying to get stuff from them and, and it is it was so reminiscent of the kind of relationship experiences of child in Vietnam with um, the American military yeah um, but but that idea of, of helping uh, or conquering That's or invading is, is so fine for me uh, to talk about you know, right. post-colonialism or any kind right. of humanitarian uh, a gesture from uh, a, a more a wealthier nation towards a nation in need. Right, that, that, that strange tension between an imperial state of mind and a helping state of mind, a, a patronizing imperial versus the real yes. needed help. Yeah. Um, and how do you how do you manage that? And that's true on a national level. It's true on a business level. It's true on a friendship level. It exists in so many realms. Um, can and, we go and, to the next? The, yeah. The child you see, you know, I mean, he's fascinated by these guys and the, guy, the kid in red. And I felt that way myself, you know. I mean, the, the, the guy with the, uh, the iPhone, uh, the, the, you know, the headphones and all the gear and... I felt that sort of attraction, but also, you know, a, a, a kind of fear of, of the unknown and a fear of, of this uh, greater force that could be as evil as bad, as good. It's uh, good, as, right. As, it, I think it's something that I, I've continued to, to uh, try to, uh, I, I mean, that's the way I now, see it. Did you make, you made this with a large format camera, right? Yes. And was it a, a five by seven? What format yes. did you use five for this? Seven. Five by seven, right? There's so many wonderful staged elements. The way that concrete, that random concrete wall becomes literally a stage set and everything's in green. And then the little boy with his shoulders akimbo is the point of red and it pops out to the fellow who's seated in the back in the red shorts. Um, could we go to the next uh, photograph, please? Lewis? I'm sure Lewis is working on getting us to the next uh, photograph. Okay, here we go. Um, so the Trump presidency, Oval Office, Saturday Night Live, NBC Studios, New York 2018. I don't know about the rest of you, but I go back and forth from listening to the news and feeling devastated and then turning on any number of comedians, whether it's Seth Meyers or, uh, or, or Saturday Night Live as a kind of respite, go swinging from one side to the other. And then there is this very strange photograph, which is indeed Saturday Night Live, but the camera is pulled way back and uh, it suspends us between, it, it, it's, it puts us once again in a place of suspension. And Anmile, could you speak about that uh, strategy and the many ways in which this image uh, you know, betrays the facade of 
various situations? Well, I think it's about those um, opposites that you talk about, about bringing all of that together. And, oh, and um, by stepping back, uh, uh, you're allowed to um, layer the photograph with meanings, with contradicting information, with uh, it, it allows you to create relationships. Um, and, uh, and obviously, we spoke about this earlier, there's a point where you would go too far back and everything would be lost, of course. Um, but, but I think that where I was standing maintains all of the tensions. Um, but I wanted to show, uh, really show that uh, the suggestion of, um, uh, of how this Oval Office is constructed and, and about the facade of power. Um, all it takes is the, um, a particular carpet, the gold, uh, um, uh, the gold curtains, uh, but but my focus also was on the people who actually do the work, uh, um, who who hang the photograph, who um, move the desk in, and 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 create all of this. And I think for me, the emblematic of the workers in the administration um, who have been there um, from one um, administration to another, and who just keep doing the work. Um, so the stagehands here and the uh, people who work in production design are the real workers and, and they, they are the builders. Um, right, so it becomes else. very emblematic of what's going on actually in the, yeah. in the Oval That's Office. They, they I, maintain, they maintain. I noticed that we have very few minutes left and I have three more pictures, yes. I, photographs I'd like to look at. So we'll just go to them. Is that okay? Yes. Okay, so um, this photograph also struck me, cars along the Rio Grande at the US-Mexico border, and it becomes a, an opportunity to speak about this business of pulling back and this long view and brought to mind, I'm just gonna show a comparison here with a 19th century photographer named uh, Teresa Dillon Llewellyn. Uh, she was part of the Talbot, Llewellyn Circle, and they were very involved in early photography. And she too is getting out. She's got this distance view. If we could go back to Anmi's photograph, uh, please. Um, and when I thought of Teresa Dillon Llewellyn, uh, I think how striking it is that as a, as a woman, that she was not at home doing these up close photographs, that there was this broad, view over the harbor. And that brings to my gender question about perspective. So I mean, your, your mother went to the Sorbonne, Sorbonne was writing a, a, a dissertation on feminist literature. Your work has this out in the world, really intense, broad view perspective in many cases. Um, there are so many things we could say about this photograph, but I want to use this as an opportunity to ask you about that gender coded quality, uh, whether you've ever thought about it as you go on these military ships and faux army bases. Well, I think we have this assumption that because women um, uh, are, um, the the major uh, family caretaker that they are close to home. Um, and uh, if there were photographers that would photograph would be convenient and, um, and, 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 and with the um, childcare. Um, but that's just an assumption. Um, um, and, and you could see it from Teresa's photograph, which is extraordinary, that she went out in the world and photographed. Um, so I don't know <laughs> how to answer that question, but I, I grew up with a bunch of boys um, uh, and I wanted to be just like them. If they jump across the river, I would jump across the river. Um, I think that my parents, uh, uh, you know, I think this is where I understood the paradoxes and how people have uh, multiple agendas. Uh, my parents would treat me the same way uh, they would treat my brothers and I was expected to do the same thing they did even though they eventually had a different agenda for me. Uh, um, but um, 
so I think it, it, it was a natural thing for me to just be out there and, and I never think of um, doing something uh, because I was a woman or not a woman. Uh, so it's right. really not an issue. Um, I, I, I like the fact that you mentioned that you grew, that you grew up with brothers and you know, your parents had a very enlightened sense of things. Um, so you didn't think of it at all that way. And so often it's perhaps just circumstances that there is this sense that women are gonna do the intimate interior photographs and men are gonna go off to these other countries. I mean, I'm thinking sort of 19th century-ish here. Yeah, um, I'm grateful to my parents for not um, ever making a big issue that I was wearing glasses a lot when I was younger and I was just in shorts and in pants. Um, but, but I still remember uh, late 1990s being in Vietnam and being in the back of a motorcycle, um, tripods attached to the motorcycle. I had one huge backpack and we had something else strapped in the back and, and driving along and, and somebody would, that I knew stopped me and said, oh my God, what are you doing with all this bag? <laughs> woman. It, so it is, like a woman. And I yeah. felt like, oh. But you know, you just shrug it off. But it, 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 it's, it's, it's on two more photographs. So could we go to the next image, please? Oh, God. So this really caught me. Um, the being uh, this submarine, um, ship divers, USS New Hampshire, Arctic Seas 2011. I couldn't help but think of Kate Blanchett's uh, 2019 film, Where'd You Go, Bernadette? Um, the drama of getting to this place. Um, could you just quickly tell us what is going on here? Um, so this submarine just uh, broke through the ice uh, um, and it's part of a biannual exercise the Navy does to test their submarines in the Arctic um, that we know of. I mean, I'm sure they do all kinds of things that we don't know about. Um, and and um, I was actually invited, and it's a long story, I won't go into it, but I, this is the only time I was ever offered a, an invitation without having to ask for something uh, to go overnight on the submarine. Um, and so it's just went through the ice and it's waiting for, um, for me and my assistant and a couple of other people to walk uh, on the lab to get on the sub. And it's extraordinary because um, that sense of, um, the beginning of the world and the end of the world, and I saw that in that um, in that moment. It, it's it wasn't a difficult picture for me to make, uh, and and so I'm not so particularly attached to it. I think I in this case I was more attached to the experience. Uh, it took a week to to make to to get there, you know, to fly to. Uh, to, to, to fly to Northern Alaska, spending one night there to get on this ice flow. We were on the ice flow for three or four days before the submarine actually came. And then we had to be on the ice flow for another two days before we, you know, so, so. It's uh, so intense. It's just so intense and so mysterious. And at the same time, so perfect. I mean, this is not a 35 millimeter photograph, right? Um, yeah, yeah, no, and, and everything was freezing, but, um, <laughs> And it was precarious, but uh, um, yeah, it was a great. Can we go to the next photograph, please? Almost there. So here, once again, is that distant view that is characteristic of of much of your work, uh, where you pan out, and this is actually not. Um, this is actually. Uh, in this country and they're staging events, uh, but it, it is an element of, that is seen in many of your photographs. I'd like to go to the last photograph to, to close and show a photograph that seems peculiarly uncharacteristic of much of your work. So again, this, this is earlier, it circles back, um, it's up close, it's poetic, um, and it uh, it has um, it has also 
the evidence of bamboo, which in and of itself is an iconic plant that is both, you know, brings to mind Vietnam, even though there is bamboo in the United States. It also is extremely strong at the same time that it is, uh, that it bends and it, it accommodates high winds. Um, and perhaps you could say something in closing about this uh, photograph that circles us back to your earlier work. So this was made on somebody's private property in North, in, in Virginia. Um, and this was in the context of these Vietnam War reenactments. So these guys actually planted the bamboo to create the look, authenticity. Um, and, and I was very struck by it. And of course it was so interesting to participate in these reenactments um, that are about the Vietnam War, that are about Vietnam in Virginia, in this North American landscape. And it, it brought me back to this idea of um, the landscape as a character. And, and growing up, all the Vietnam War movies, the early on, I think most of them actually, uh, were not, never shot in Vietnam. They were shot in, because you, you, um, the filmmakers could not have permission to, to work in Vietnam. So they were shot in Indonesia, in Malaysia. Um, but I could tell right away from the color of the palm trees or full metal jacket, the palm trees were from North Africa brought to London. And so this idea of the landscape as a protagonist, so interesting to me. Um, and, and um, you know, the signifier, the bamboo uh, standing in for Vietnam, somehow that should be enough uh, to, to signal that we were in Vietnam now. Um, yeah. Extraordinary to me. Well, on the, Thank you so much. Um, I just cannot um, express enough how much I appreciate this opportunity. And I see you really as a, a, a trained scientist, as a superior uh, photographer, <laughs> a champion of landscape uh, uh, photography. Um, and it's been really an honor to have this opportunity. Thank Lucy, thank you so much. You know, I'm so into my head with my ideas and it's so wonderful to be uh, brought out uh, uh, from um, what I usually think about. And, and uh, I really appreciate all your great questions and introducing me to Teresa's work and um, so many other things. And, and thank you. And thank you, Fong. Uh, and thank you, Brooke and Rao, for this great um, coordination and this great event. Aww. Um. Thank. Thanks to both of you for this incredible conversation. I feel so lucky that we've gotten to uh, be here all together. Um. I think now is a good moment to transition to the question answer portion. So we have uh, a few questions lined up, and the first one comes from our very own Tyler. Uh, Tyler, can you unmute yourself? Just trying to clean off my camera a bit here. <laughs> oh my god, I love the effect. Hi, Lily. You look like a Barbara S. photograph. Yes. Um, I was interested in um, how Crutzen and Wall were brought up for their um, staging and their tableaus and how it relates to your work with restaging real events or like restaging reality. And I was, I was just interested to hear you talk more about that and how that um uh, uh for me it's more um it's not necessarily a, a method of work i mean it's not necessarily uh um it, it's more it, it's it, it's more about solving problems and and uh i'm interested in going out and experiencing uh something and seeing something for myself and uh, you do what you need to do. And I, I felt that to get the results I needed, I needed at times to direct quite a lot. Other times it, it's all there and it's a total gift. Um, and so I, I don't really think about it that much. I think um, what I think about really is when I leave the situation, have I taken advantage of what was offered? Um, did I push it to the extreme? Did I should I have I asked that person to move or should I have done this? And, and I do also know that um, uh, sometimes when you, oh, you direct too much, things become contrived. So that 
touch is, is that fine line. I never know where it is. Um, and so it's, I'm always, um, um, you know, over guessing. Um, and, and I think that the situations I've worked with doesn't really allow me to have so much time. You know, people work, people uh, um, um, are stopping for a second to help me out. So it, it, it's very transitory. It's at the same time, so very spontaneous when you think about constructions and directing. Uh, so for me, it's just a mean to an end more than a um, philosophical um, underpinning to the work. Yeah, I was thinking um, about maybe the way that you see the world as the stage, whether maybe there isn't like so much of you enacting restaging, but that you're already seeing a stage. Yeah, front. I think I, I see it as a stage and I think, oh my God, that's amazing. So how can I, you know, make it, my, make it for myself? How can I take it? Uh, or how can I bring it back? Uh, or in an interesting way? Uh, or what does that experience really mean? Um, how can I uh, filter it and how can I transform it a bit? Uh, so, I mean, I think there are many ways, you know, there's not one formula um, I go out there and it's scary in a way. Um, I, I never know uh, what is required. I, I never know what I'll find. I mean, I'm pretty certain at this point that I'll always find something. I think it's rare that I've gone out and, and, and not and feel com that it was a total failure in terms of seeing something uh, or experiencing something. But um, yeah, it's a, it's a stage. It, um, but I think it's a stage. Uh, whoever designed the stage is, is brilliant because I, 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 I'm always surprised. Um, I'm always learning something new and I'm always confounded. Um, so so I, I, I feel a bit at loss, um, not being able to go out as much right now, to, to be honest, yeah. I do go out, but it's... Thank you for that answer. Um, our next question will come from uh, the art historian, Charlotte Wellman. Charlotte, I'm unmuting you now. Okay, thank you. Um, Tyler, your question um, relates a great deal to the question that um, I have in the chat. Um, and I'm struck, and I will carry away with me your comment um, uh, uh, about how you perceived uh, the war in Vietnam as horrifying from the television screen in Paris, um, and how that contrasted the way you reacted to experiencing that conflict when you were actually immersed in it physically. And I'm wondering if we could bring that memory into a relationship with the photographs that we've been looking at by you today. Um, my question related to the, my, my perception that your work in a lot of ways is very cinematic um, and choreographed to a certain extent. I think that plays with the more improvisational character of your vision. Um, and that in so many of these images, you step away from your subject as if seeing it from a distance. And that suggested two different perspectives to me. One is that of an onlooker, someone who's bearing witness, but it's also the perspective that a director takes in the movie. And those are two such different vantage points. And I'm wondering if you could comment on the relationship between those two things, those two perspectives. Well, I mean, if you go back to your original um, points about uh, watching the, the war on television versus living it, you know, um, I think the difference um, may be parallel to your notion of what an onlooker and a director is. And as a non-looker, you are passive. Uh, you just sitting there and and watching the news unfolding, and I think it's it's um, it's nerve wracking to not be able to do anything. Um, and as a director or as being in Vietnam, I think I think you you are a participant. So what do you do? You go out and stock up on food. You make sure that your um, 
that your windows are uh, protected and you, you, or you have to go to school and how do you get to school safely? You know, so you, you think about all these um, practical things you have to do. And so um, I, I think as a director, I, I, I feel involved and, and I make the decisions. This is, and, and, uh, but I think that a director can also be an onlooker by taking that step back. And, and the reason why I take a step back and at first, you know, People always say, oh, your perspective and you're so far away. And I'm thinking, well, I'm my coward. And that's why I'm always like so far back. But, but it's not necessarily that. I think that when you see something too horrific or too up close, you can't think. And with a little bit of room, you actually uh, have your wits together and you don't react so emotionally. And, and you can actually think, how do I feel about something that just happened there? And so it's the ability to um, experience something, but also having uh, the room to, to think uh, if there's such a point. And I think that's, that's where I try to stand. Um, close enough so that you sensorially and physically uh, feel all of that, but also have enough room to, to think and see all the relationships I'm trying to create in this picture that, that feels like it's kind of moving around with so much information. Uh, and, and obviously you get too close and then you lose so much perspective and you have to think in a more of a tunnel vision and 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 if you step back too far you lose all the relationships and you really then become a distant onlooker and and you feel completely disconnected so how do you keep somebody connected without overwhelming them do you think the camera serves in a sense as your third eye in that respect that once you look at the contact sheet or print the image, that you see things in that photograph that you had not seen when you were on scene? Oh, for sure, because I, I think you can't think straight. You know, I mean, you think before, but when you are out there photographing, it's all very intuitive and the decisions to be made very quickly. Um, it, it, it's very difficult. You know, I, I make aesthetic decisions um, and sometimes I decide, oh, this is too much, this is not, or uh, I, unfortunately censor myself i shouldn't but but so much of the thinking is done when i look at the contact sheet but the view camera i'm glad you brought up the third the third eye the view camera is is, is actually extraordinary in the sense that you don't carry it to your face so it's like a piece of furniture you know it's on its tripod it's standing next to me and i go underneath and i put the dark cloth on but then i'm done and i'm standing next to it and i'm talking to whoever i'm photographing so it's a totally different kind of relationship that I can have with my subject. And, and if I had to give up the view camera for whatever reason, and I think about it all the time, um, I think that's what I would miss the most. It's that ability to see something on a large screen and then just have it on the side. Um, and, and, you know, it, it, it's about per perceiving the image, you know, and then I just kind of remember what the frame is and I see it out there in the field the camera is almost non-existent. So I don't really use the camera anymore. <laughs> if that makes sense. Because most people carry the camera to their face and, and, and they interface with the world or who they're photographing with that camera. I mean, and of course, Diana Arbus looked down uh, with her viewfinder at the waist, but us view camera photographers have, a, I think, a different relationship. And that relationship is important to me more than the camera itself. I, I've got to say, as, you, as you're talking about this and talking about the camera as a piece of furniture, the one element that we did not even mention that I think is the punctum in to, 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 to talk Bart about the Navy watch standard, the photograph of the, of the woman looking through the, um, the telescope, yes, is the table. Oh yes, the lawn chairs, oh. yes. Uh, it's, I think it's Martha Stewart. Um, I actually asked them why they, they it was actually brought from the United States and, and um, they don't use metal because it would rust and um, it's heavy and it won't fly away. Um, and and, and um, I wanted that relationship between something that is domestic um, um, with uh, uh, the situation. Um, it's, it's like the tripod that she's got, which is a surrogate for your camera as well. And it holds, it holds the, 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 the skyline, it holds the horizon. 
Um, so it's full and empty at the same time. It's just a marvelous, uh, you know, it's almost the way Bart always said that, you know, without the punctum, uh, the, the photograph would, would be a different image. And this would be a different image without the table. Uh, it, it's marvelous. Yeah, no, I, I, I didn't think of the table as the punctum. I mean, some, I often think of my pictures as having mostly studium and no punctum. And if it had punctum, it would fail. Uh, um, but yes, I, I, I love the idea that the table um, in unexpected way is the punctum. Yeah. It, it's kind of a ridiculous punctum. <laughs> um, I don't know. I'm, I'm hogging. I'm hogging here, Malvika. Do you want me to ask my second question, or I'd love to hear um, your second question? Okay. So um, my second question is about the theme of borders. Um, I I feel as if this is a theme also that runs through the what the what border borders. Just the theme of borders, yes. the notion of borders, and on, on all sorts of different levels. Um, uh, even the tree. Uh, that you showed, I see as being kind of an individual standing separately from, a, from the other trees in that row against a kind of more corporate landscape that has a lot of fencing and demarcations that are very artificial and man-made. Um, so I'm just wondering um, about how you think about the notion of borders um, and um, how you see those evolving throughout the, uh, how, how how, how has that theme evolved, do you feel, um, in the series um, that, that you've created? Well, I think Events Ashore is so much about borders, you know, especially in the ocean. You know, it's so arbitrary, it seems like. Um, and uh, um, it, it, it's so hard to even define it. You know, I think the issues of geopolitical borders is interesting to me. And obviously, uh, the 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 47th parallel in Vietnam, North and South, and, and so much of it was about this border of the DMZ, um, and, and the Civil War in Vietnam is about all about borders. So um, it, it comes back to that, but I think that Texas-Mexico shows that uh, border is, 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 is something that we construct uh, that perhaps should not exist. And, and you know, I mean, I realized that, um, or I saw, I read, but I saw for myself how um, the, the flow of life across the border is extraordinary. Um, the American, ran the Texan ranchers um, rely on um, so much help from Mexico um, and vice versa. Um, people cross to go have lunch uh, with their family and return. Um, people go shopping. So, so I think it, it is um, something that we have created to perhaps uh, uh, simplify things and to, um, I mean, I, 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 it's, it's like, I remember, you know, asking as a young child, why uh, is the North fighting with the South? And, and my, my mom said, well, look at you and your brother, you know, you're like demarcating your bedroom and what is yours and what is your bookshelf, and your brother, and still it's not enough. You guys are constantly fighting what is mine, what is yours, and where does your room end and where, you know, so, and, 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 and that sense of uh, uh, why we do what we do and, and this sense of border to try to delineate what we own and what we don't own and what we have control over, um, it, it, it seems inevitable. Um, but uh, I, I learned so much from um, my um, short visit to, um, the Texas-Mexico border. We would cross the border every day, um, taking our gear and just cross and go photograph because it was a lot easier than driving. Um, and, and to experience that and having to cross and showing IDs and uh, seeing the difference between how we would be perceived, my assistant and I, versus uh, someone else who's Mexican, um, kind of brought up a, a lot of things I've experienced in the past. Um, so, yeah, thank you. Um, thank you both. I especially loved uh, that line that you said, I think of my photographs as mostly stadium, and if they were to be pumped on, they would fail. I think that's incredible. Um, our next question is coming from Anna. Anna, I'm unmuting you now. Can you hear? 
Yes, yes, I can hear you. Okay. okay. <laughs> yes, great. Um, I wanted to ask uh, about in the first photos we saw where uh, it's uh, some people and uh, this kind of, I would say in French, uh, jeu de regard. I don't know how you could translate it. Yeah, when you look like. Uh, when play, you play with the, with play with the, the, the gaze. Yes, exactly. And uh, people are ma mo mostly always like looking out of the frame or also the women standing and the police are in I Iraq and the girls, like the other black women looking outside and the girls somehow looking at each other, but kind of never someone looks directly to you or to us kind of when we see this final image. Uh, are you? Uh, interested or avoid or not uh, this kind of spectator, no, complicity or spectator? Yeah. How do you consider spectatorship? Or? No, it's an interesting question. Uh, I'm not a great portrait photographer. I mean, I think that picture, they're looking straight at me, but they're so far away that yes. I, I think, um, I don't think the issue is as important, but I think in a portrait, uh, it is important um, when they, when there's a gaze with the photographer and it's important in the sense that it would mostly fail um, when it's not well done and, and again I'm not a portrait photographer but if you look at Judith Joy Ross's portraits and um, so many um, but her in particular you know that there's she somehow manages to create a relationship with the subject and um, there's the flow um, that exists and so when the subject is returning the gaze, we as, as viewers are privy to that flow. But most of the time the flow is not there. So when the subject returns the gaze, it, it feels like a, they're just looking and it's a pushback and it's a kind of contrived and empty gaze. So it's a very difficult thing to do. Um, um, and I think Judith Ross does that um, extremely well. Oh, which she's a great portrait photographer. That's what I mean. Yes, I think that's okay. Or I, I just this. Uh, or keep going. Uh, this question about this photograph under the bridge also is: the, How much do you play with these symbolics or bridge and shadow or shelter or not? Or uh, well, well, I don't think that you can think in those terms, you know, mm -hmm. when you make the picture. Um, I love the structure of the bridge. Um, I love the scale. I love how they, the family was together. And it seemed that it had all kinds of elements. And, but you don't really analyze all that when you're actually making the picture. So I think I do look closely and analyze that when I look at the contact sheet. and and. And that's when you eliminate things and that's when you keep things. And so, um, but, but obviously, you know, my understanding, my knowledge of art, um, my influences, uh, you know, all of that is, is, is stocked up in your consciousness when you go out and photograph. Mm -hmm. And so you wear a lot of things and, 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 and you kind of, uh, move through all of that and, and make your picture. But I think when you're making the picture, you just so focus, you're in a different zone and, and you don't know anything else. I can't hear anything. Um, you're just making the picture. And I think then you come back to reality and then you think of, oh my God, uh, did I overdo that? Or <laughs> not the Manet picture, you know? Uh, um, but when you're actually making a picture, you know, I think, I don't, um, I'm pretty much in the zone. Yes. <laughs> okay, thank you. Okay, thank you so much. Um, our next question is coming from Tina Barney and I wanted to give a special thank you to Tina. Um, Hi, Tina. Yeah, uh, I am going to read Tina's question on their behalf. Um, the question is, uh, for Anmi, uh, have you ever or would you ever move objects for formal formal concerns? Uh, yes, I, I move people, I move objects, and um, 
I've used Photoshop, you know, n not to bring in unrelated things, but you know, I have, um, I don't do it often, but sometimes I have similar negatives and, and there's one that's a little cleaner. I, I remove things. Um, I have no problem with any of it. And, and I, I think it goes back to Tyler saying, you know, it's a stage and so um, anything's possible. Um, and, and obviously, you know, you, sometimes you go too far because you have so many tools and so many possibilities. So um, I think that it has helped that uh, I grew up um, pre-Photoshop and, and, and understand the limitations and appreciate the limitations of um, not being able to change so much and manipulate things. I hope. Lucy, did you want to say something? I'm sure you have something. Um, I'm just so right. grateful to these questions because they were all, they were um, on my mind and I just couldn't do everything, but uh, particularly the one about the frame, about boundary, the third eye, really wonderful additions. Oh, I'm, I'm so glad, but we actually have one more. Um, and I, I just wanna, uh, get that one in. So this last question is from Min Bui. Um, Min, I'm going to unmute you now. Okay. For today's uh, talk, is my audio okay? Yes, perfect. All right, thank you. Um, so at the top of the, this talk, Lucy brought up this term uh, about rupturing with the examples of um, moving from one country to another or um, the period of adolescence. So that for me implied this idea that rupture was a one directional movement or experience. Um, and another way that rupture can be interpreted is um, something or someone that has to be fixed, which needs to be sutured. But uh, my question for uh, Ami is, how does the act of re uh, returning, which opens it up to the multi-directional, redefine what rupture is? Oh, you mean returning to Vietnam? Oh, not not just returning to Vietnam. Like that that's one literal way of understanding it, but it could also be conceptual as well. Um, I think the projects are always um, about healing for myself in the sense that uh, either I have anxieties, I have unanswered questions, and, and I think that's, that's what mo motivates me to, to do the work I do and to, um, and so, um, I think it's about a, a kind of a, a kind of healing in some ways. Um, I think, for example, working the Vietnam War reenactors was was a, a, a surreal experience, and and um, uh, because of how psychological and how weird it was, but it, I felt. Um, I felt somewhat uh, um, a bit more resolved afterwards um, about uh, the effect of the war and, and, and perhaps I think trying to understand its effect on someone else on the American uh, cultural imagination and how it was perpetuated still was uh, very interesting for me. Um, half. Um, yeah, uh, uh, Lucy? Um, I I, the reason I opened by having your more recent life and then circling back to that moment in Vietnam to enter your work is that um, in some broad way, I think of that moment as a teenager, leaving your, the land where you were born um, is the scratch in the record. It is the moment that you keep going back to and all I could look at all of the work as in some way this healing process of how do you deal with boundary, how do you deal with distance, how do you deal with you know leaving the place you know, going to the place that you don't know, then 
going back and not knowing the place that you used to know. I mean, yeah. that perhaps addresses a little bit the last question. I think um, so too. And, yeah. and realizing that my home is here. <laughs> in the right, end. right. Um, or that, that but, American uh, notion of you can't go home again, right? Yeah. Um, it, it just isn't, that place isn't there anymore. But to go back to Bart, you know, um, and that idea of the has been and, and the essence of something captured on an image on a photograph itself. I, I think that that was my original intention going back to Vietnam um, is having these vague memories or these ideas of what it was like to grow up in the countryside and then some that and making it really a real and tangential and, and take it with me in case we have another war. And, and right. I, that's, that was my, um, that was the urge I had. Of course, things happen and things change, but that was the original urge. Right. I like the, I like the word that you use to, to hold everything, which is this project. Each level of your work has this healing element in it um, to address that initial boundary crossing. Yeah, healing sounds so um, uh, cheesy, but um, I, I, I think it's just... Uh, answer questions yeah to to have some clarity and to uh, um to not feel so anxious especially right now well, thank you how to be useful um how to contribute i i i don't know yeah i i and and me thank you for a thoughtful conversation and thank you lucy i just want to add one thing to min Bui. I, I hope it's not a relative, but <laughs> maybe. But we all have different way of uh, mediate with past experiences. I think for the most part, as artists, creative individual, we desire to leave home. I mean, this is what the artist is about, which compelled James Joy to rewrite Ulysses. And I remember when Beckett came to Paris in order to work for Joyce, he was asked because he remained there for the rest of his life, why do you leave Ireland? You know, and he say, I rather live in Paris during wartime than Ireland in peace. But I think the way that for you to have come back and return um, is absolutely a equivalent of form of healing. Healing is not a cheesy word, and me. It's a very powerful word. And, you know, for was on the rest of us, most of us that we know, to be individualized is a very powerful thing to do. In other words, we go against the grain from confusion, Buddhist upbringing. To be a unique individual is not been embraced, has never been embraced in Asia. So it's a, I think from returning have been very fruitful and productive for you, I think. For me, my way of doing the rail is create a symphony of potentially uh, equivalent of demo, democratic vista. It's also a very Buddhist view perspective to embrace everyone together in this orbit. You know, it's a form of healing too. Yeah. Absolutely. So anyway, thank you so much. I just want to thank you, Fong, and thank you, Lucy. Thank you. Thank you all for that. Um, the rail has a daily ritual of ending our lunch with a poem. Today, our brilliant art editor, Sarah Rufino, will be reading for us. Sarah? Let's see. Sarah, I'm going to unmute you now. Oh, you're unmuted. Great. Nice. Thank you for having me. Um, I'm going to read a Whitman poem. I believe that was requested. Right. <laughs> um, it is to a stranger. Passing stranger, you do not know how longingly I look upon you. You must be he I was seeking or she I was seeking. It comes to me as of a dream. I have somewhere surely lived a life of joy with you. All is recalled as we flit by each other, fluid, affectionate, chaste, matured. You grew up with me, were a boy with me, or a girl with me. 
I ate with you and slept with you. Your body has become not yours only, nor left my body mine only. You give me the pleasure of your eyes, face, flesh, as we pass. You take of my beard, breast, hands in return. I am not to speak to you. I am to think of you when I sit alone or wake at night alone. I am to wait. I do not doubt I am to meet you again. I am to see to it that I do not lose you. Thank you for that. Um, please join us again uh, next week for our, new, our next lineup of social, new social environment conversations. Um, always at lunchtime, always at 1 p.m. Uh, on Monday, we'll be having artist Jim Melcher joining us in conversation with curator Constance Lou Allen. On Tuesday, artist and filmmaker Jatukovia Gary will be joining us in dialogue with the charming Arvind Hall. On Wednesday, independent art historian and curator Daisy De Rosier will join us with our very own Yassi Ali Poor. Thursday, we have Tom Cahill and Allison Scott Williams from Studio in a School joining us with Jessica Holmes. And finally, on Friday, painter Malvi Levenstein will be joining us with art historian Jason Rosenfeld. Um, thank you all for joining in and feel free to feel free to unmute yourselves and say goodbye as you leave. Um, this has been absolutely delicious. Thank you, Anmi. Thank, thank you, Lucy. Thanks, Anmi. Thanks, Lucy. Thank you. Thank you, Rail. Thank you, Thank you, so Thanks for the poem, Sarah. Thank, thank you, you, Sarah. Thank you, Charlotte, for, Thanks for the questions. questions. Thank you, Dr. Wellman. I'm so happy to see you here. Oh, I'm so happy to see you, Nick. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining. Thank you, and have a great weekend. Yes. Yeah. Try to have a great weekend. Yeah, yeah, see. Bye. <laughs> Bye. Have a great weekend. Uh, be courageous. Hi, Hi Robert. Hi, Charlie. Bye-bye. That little girl was so quiet. Hi, Lucy. Thank you. <laughs> Hi Lucy, thank you so much. It was great to meet you online. Hope to meet you in person. In person at the gallery at yes. Marion Goodman. Yes. Bye everyone. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.